Welcome to the Bass Reeves Gun Club podcast, where we discuss all things firearm and shooting sports. I'm your host, Antonio Hicks, and I'm excited to bring you the latest news, tips, tricks, and historic discussions about guns in the minority community. We are a pro Second Amendment community of responsibly armed citizens, and we take pride in learning and sharing our knowledge within the community. So whether you're a seasoned pro or just starting out, this podcast is for you. So sit back, relax, and let's dive in. Today's episodes dive deep into a critical aspect of African-American history, the complex relationship between black communities and gun ownerships. Throughout time, firearms has represented both a tool for survival and a symbol of oppression. Joining us to navigate this fascinating topic is Doug Jefferson, the National Vice President of the National African American Gun Association, also known as NAGA. I welcome on Doug Jefferson, National Vice President of NAGA. In a discussion of food or bullets, how have we prioritized gun ownership throughout African American history? So in 1892, Ida B. Wells advised that the Winchester rifle deserved a place of honor in every black home. We say this almost cliche-ish today, but she was serious about this as a personal security approach. So leading off into our first discussion, have we in fact made gun ownership a priority as a community? Well, over the course of uh, African-American history, uh, it's sort of ebbed and flowed how much emphasis that we've put on gun ownership. Uh, The firearm for the African-American community has been both a tool for uh, sustainment as far as uh, hunting, uh, being able to gather food and feed a family, but also a tool uh, for security of being able to defend uh, themselves as individuals, but also defend the community as well. And so as different pressures on the community have have changed and morphed, ebbed and flowed throughout uh, history, you've seen different emphasis on whether or not African-Americans have really embraced uh, farms ownership. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say in the modern day, there's been an uptick in it within the last, uh, you know, five to 10 years mm-hmm. uh, due to some various changes of pressure. Uh, we've certainly been in a, a sort of an upheaval period. Uh, like an increase in gun sales in the black. Correct. So okay. increasing in gun sales, increasing in uh, gun ownership, mm-hmm. increasing in uh, involvement in uh, firearms mm-hmm. training mm-hmm. Uh, and firearms usage, whether it be for uh, self-defense or for competition or for hunting. We're, we're really seeing a resurgence in all of these areas when it comes to gun ownership uh, amongst the African-American community. Now, even though we're at under 30 percent, do you think the African-American community should make this a priority? As a community, well, personally, uh, you know, I'm a little biased in this, obviously, Mm -hmm. but I would say yes. I think that the African-American community should make gun ownership a priority. Now, I say that with the caveat of understanding that when it comes to each individual person, each individual household, there are a million priorities that you have to balance as far as like what is most important, what's getting that that time, that information. And so mm-hmm. that's got to be balanced against everything in life. I mean, we there's there's no one facet of life, whether it's our jobs, whether it's our family, whether it's our community, whether it's whatever that we can just solely say, hey, that's the only thing that we care about. And we don't make any consideration for anything else. Right. There has mm-hmm. to be a balance. So I, I think what should be happening is each individual African-American should look at gun ownership through a proper nuanced and contextualized lens and evaluate how big of a place it should have in their lives uh, and how beneficial it can be. Now, after making those considerations, if it comes to the conclusion that, hey, for me, it doesn't work, okay, that's fine. But I think the consideration should be made by every African-American and every African-American home. Now, why would you say they wouldn't think that it, it, it would work? Well, once we kind of had this discussion in the last episode mm-hmm. when it came to like gun ownership within the African American community. Mm-hmm. So you have uh, once again we talk about those different pressures and different cultural influences. So, mm-hmm. for instance, um, I grew up in the South, uh, born and raised in Georgia. My family goes back in Georgia generations, generations. <laughs> Yeah, I, Georgia boys. I, I mean, yeah. when it comes to us people from the South, yes. Yeah, so I, I can look at my 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 grandparents and my great grandparents, and they were gun owners. Uh huh. Now I can speak of when growing up, that wasn't necessarily something that they talked about mm-hmm. um, per se, but it wasn't something that was hidden either. Uh, so my grandfather, um, uh, who recently passed uh, about, about a couple of years ago. Uh, up to the day he died, he kept a shotgun by his bed, and he had a pistol that he kept in the house as well. Mm-hmm. And I can remember as a child going to my grandparents' house and, you know, playing with my cousins, and we're just, you know, hanging out and 
you go by grandma and grandpa's room and look in there and see like, okay, there's, there's a gun sitting by grandpa's bed. And, mm-hmm. You know, I knew what a gun was at the time. I'm probably about nine years old. So I knew what it was. And, you know, my parents had the conversation about it. It's like, hey, like you see him, you know, just go run up to him and touch him. Uh, and my parents were pretty gun agnostic in the sense of they weren't pro or anti in their conversations. It was mm-hmm. just more so guns exist. They're this thing that are out there that can be used for good or for bad. It's depending on who the person is and how they use them. That was a conversation basis. So I remember going to my grandfather and asking him about, hey, you know, I saw that shotgun there, you know, mm-hmm. what's, what's up with that? And <laughs> his response was, uh, well, I keep it there to protect the home from four-legged critters and two-legged critters. And, <laughs> you know, to my nine-year-old brain, it's like, okay, well, that sounds like a reasonable you know, uh, uh, reason to have a firearm. So I just went off and played with my cousin some more. Right. Um, but, but that is to say, like, it was just a normal thing. It wasn't, it wasn't taboo. It wasn't seen as this negative. It was just a, a part of life. Yeah. Um, so that's my background. Now I have friends and acquaintances that they came from a different experience when it came to firearms. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they grew up in uh, an inner city somewhere up North and in the Midwest, uh, they may have had, they may have immigrated over here, rather their, their parents or their grandparents may have immigrated over here from somewhere else in the diaspora. So maybe the Caribbean or from the continents. Mm-hmm. Uh, and their conversation about firearms was completely different. Their parents were very uh, much had negative views about guns. It's like, you don't touch them, you know, they're bad, stay away from them. Mm-hmm. And then their experiences and within their community, uh, they had members of the community that would use firearms and commission of crimes. Uh, and then you had police forces that were not very well invested in the well-being of that community mm-hmm. and would also harass and abuse the community as well. So the two groups of people that you run into, whether that had guns, were all doing something negative. It, but wouldn't it make much more sense to have a weapon then? Well, it would make sense to have a weapon, but you have to think about human nature. Mm -hmm. So nobody wants to be affiliated with something that is perceived as this negative taboo thing that everyone else wants to stay away from, particularly if it's people within their in-group or those that they claim to be a part of or be accepted by. Right. So if that group says like, okay, this thing is bad and we don't want anything to do with it, mm-hmm. you're not really incentivized to have any involvement with it, even if you have a genuine interest, because most of the people that you're going to talk to in your group are going to shut down that conversation. That's seeing the people that you, you're you closest to, that you that you trust, be they parents, be they mentors, be they wh- whoever they may be. You know, they have this negative view of farms. So even bringing it up that you're owning, it's just like, like, oh, my God, you know, clutching of pearls moment. You know, who are you? I don't know. You know, it, you just get all of these negative reactions. So you're not really incentivized to go beyond that. Mm-hmm. Um, now, once you kind of grow up and you you kind of separate yourself out, you know, as you become an adult and you're going finding your own way, then there's some space that maybe you, you do a little bit more investigation into that. And once again, going back to those same friends and acquaintances, that's normally how they came into it. It was after they grew up, after they moved out. They went and lived a little bit of life. They were in a different environment where it was more incentivized to, at the very least, investigate it mm-hmm. and be able to make their own assessment of it. And then they came to the conclusion that, like, hey, this is something that I find useful to myself, useful to my family, useful to my community, and I'm going to embrace it. Yeah, I had something similar, like, within my household growing up because I had a grand- my grandfather. He kept uh, a shotgun and a, um, a handgun in the house, but he primarily used it to tuck away money that he didn't want my grandma knowing anything about. <laughs> But I mean, it was still there to be, you know, if something happened, he, it was a protected household. But for the like 90 percent of the time, it had wads of cash stuffed inside of it. But ironically, though, even though he had that in there, his his children were kind of opposed to weapons. Mm-hmm. Like my mom was opposed to having a weapon within the house. And so were uh, her siblings. Well, a couple of her siblings, the, like the boys, they weren't. They ended up purchasing firearms themselves. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of how I got introduced to firearms. I of my grandfather having a shotgun is this. And then my my dad's side of the family his brother was an ex FBI agent. So we would go to his house and then he would like teach us how to like to shoot like uh, the rifles and stuff into right. the backyard and then like BB guns and stuff. Cause he was hunting. He was, he was killing all the squirrels that came <laughs> onto his property. So why is it that to get into that discussion, like in your opinion, why do you think that would be such a taboo thing in, in the household? Like, did you experience the same thing in your household to where your grandfather had it, mm-hmm. but were other family members like hesitant upon adapting that in? Because I can see other families now practicing the same thing. Sure. Um, so within my household growing up, um, like I said, my parents were pretty gun agnostic. So mm-hmm. they told us about what guns were, said, hey, 
they're this thing that exists um, that can be dangerous if used incorrectly. They can be harmful, but it comes down to what your intent is and whether you're, you know, a good person acting in good faith or a bad person acting in bad faith. What about your other family members? Other family members, not really a lot of conversation about firearms, um, okay. particularly on my mom's side. Like, because once again, my mom and all my aunts and uncles, like, you know, they grew up in the same household, so they knew mm -hmm. about firearms. Uh, I think maybe you know, one of my uncles, he he owned a pistol. But once again, there wasn't a lot of talk. It was just like it was just this thing that was there. It was just a normalized. We know it's thing. there. Yeah, we know it's there. It mm -hmm. would it would having a conversation of it would be like having a conversation about cars having tires. Like, well, yeah, of course, cars have tires. Right. That was kind of the mindset. Like, we know it's there. It's this thing. It's not a big deal. OK. Uh, on my dad's side. They were a little bit more hesitant and reserved on firearms because uh, I, you know, remember conversations with my aunts and uncles on that side of the family. Mm -hmm. But once again, not like uh, not just super, hey, have nothing to do with it. Just kind of like a, a reservation or hesitation whenever it came around conversations about firearms. And, and my dad, he grew up in uh, the inner city mm -hmm. uh, along with my his, his, his brothers and sisters versus my mother who grew up in the country. So once again, those different cultural influences kind of impacting, you know, mm -hmm. what their experiences were and what their thoughts were on on firearms. OK. So what type of people within our community have historically prioritized owning firearms, in your opinion? So historically, in our community, of course, those that were uh, more from more rural backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So if they lived on farms or uh, lived lived in, in some type of more rural lifestyle. Um, you have to remember the, the historically African American community has been a very a very rural community, mm -hmm. and that is because so many of our ancestors were brought over here and enslaved in the Southern United States. Right. So, you know, in that enslavement, work in the fields, uh, but also believe it or not, some involvement in hunting and usage of farms as well. Now, under very very restrictive uh, conditions, but. You did have uh, individual enslaved people that came out of the institution of slavery that had were very highly competent with firearms mm -hmm. because they were, you know, the person that went with the master and his crew on the hunt to go, you know, kill foxes or hunt pigeons or ducks or, or whatever the game was. Uh, okay. And of course, once again, under very, very tightly controlled means that they have access to those firearms. But, you know, they were very good at using them. Uh, but then coming out of enslavement. Um, you know, you had a, a large number of African-American men that served during the Civil War in the Union Army. And so they saw the value in having those firearms because only then were they able to fight for their freedom effectively uh, against the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. And then becoming fully fledged citizens of the United States and having access to all the rights and privileges the United States Constitution is supposed to afford all United States citizens, uh, which was inclusive of African-Americans at the time once it passed that uh, 14th Amendment. You had this real eye-opening moment of embrace, like, "Hey, these are these are rights that we really need to exercise." Well, one thing about the enslaved people coming out of the institution of slavery is that we took the Constitution, the words in it, very literally. Mm -hmm. So, if it literally said, "This is what you're supposed to have as a citizen," we'd be like, "Hey, we're supposed to have that." And so, going back to those Union soldiers, they saw the benefits of having uh, those rights. And the two that were most highly demanded by those groups mm -hmm. were the right to vote, because the right to vote allows you to have a say in your community, to choose your representation, and choose the policies and laws that govern you, but mm -hmm. also the right to bear arms, which allows you to protect yourself and protect your community from those that would try to inhibit on your franch uh, the franchise to vote and other rights and things uh, that you're guaranteed under the uh, United States Constitution. So those are two rights that are very, very closely linked going back to uh, that. And, and then living in the <laughs> in the South and the rural communities, you know, when the institution of slavery stopped, it's not as if all of these, you know, former enslavers and those that supported that institution all of a sudden believed that African-American no, people they did were not. equal to them. Right. And we're going to treat them as such. That's just not what happened. Mm -hmm. You know, we had almost 100 years of neo-slavery that followed that all the way up until the civil rights movement in the 1960s that, um, you know, most most folks know a lot about. But during that time, it was extremely critical to embrace and protect those rights. And by protecting them, it meant like actually utilizing them. And so once again, you know, you had the quote at the beginning, talk about Ida B. Wells mm -hmm. and her uh, mention of, hey, the, the Winchester rifle having a place of 
honor in every African American home. Uh, and the the second part of that quote that a lot of people leave out, which gives context to that, is that and, and I'm kind of paraphrasing it, so don't take this word for word. But basically, she's saying it's it's to protect African American people from uh, to provide protection to African American people that the government can't or refuses to provide. And that protection that she was referring to is protection against unlawful lynching, abuse, murder, rape, et cetera, which mm-hmm. was prevalent during that time period. Uh, you even as far as uh, individuals like uh, uh, Bishop Henry McNeil Turner, who's he was a he was a black pastor who also, you know, you know, he's in the church. He's a he's a leader of a church saying, like, hey, black people, make sure you have firearms to protect yourselves. I think we need to see more of that today, too, though. Because we see typically from a lot of pastors, I know it's a little bit off topic itself, sure. but pastors will typically just tell you just, you know, just go out and just pray and right. allow God to, you know, to do his thing. But right. And and once again, there's there's a there's a history where that comes from that we have to understand. And also going a little bit off topic, but I, I want to make sure that we understand that whether you have African-Americans that push for gun ownership and usage mm-hmm. or African-Americans that said like, hey, let's not use the farms. There's very real legitimate reasons why they came to those stances. So we've talked about why there's that push to use them. The push against it just comes down to very natural human instinct. African-American people mm-hmm. that use firearms to protect themselves, if you're using the firearm to protect the field, that, that means that there is a non-zero chance that that perpetrator that comes from the right community to, to, to abuse, to kill, to rape, to murder, is going to get injured or die. And those white people were not going to accept that. They were going to do everything in their power to make an example of that black person mm-hmm. who dared to raise their hand in self-defense to defend themselves in their community and harm a white person. And that's when you would see some of the most horrific um, cases of lynching where, you know, the bodies are burned and mutilated, the genitals cut off, you know, pieces of the body kept as souvenirs and the whole town comes out to look and watch. That was to make an example to say like, hey, if you're going to stand up for yourself and not allow us to abuse you, this is what's going to happen to you. So that comes from a place of fear. It comes from a place of fear. Exactly. And so naturally parents, mothers, fathers, um, they're going to say, hey, you know what? I don't want you anywhere near this because Mm -hmm. I don't want you at increased risk of abuse. Yes, it's bad. Yes, you're spat on. Yes, you look down and let you push on, but at least you're alive. You know, and then that goes into once again, as we progress out of slavery and we have African Americans moving into those inner cities and we see some of those, you know, abuses and excesses of those police forces acting in a lot of times in the same manner Mm -hmm. as some of those slave masters that, you know, they're grandparents and great grandparents experience that same type of of mindsets it's in like hey look i know it's bad you know you're being stopped and frisked pushed up against the wall you know beat up and tripped or whatever but at least you're not dead but is there a way to truly live like if you always live in a place of of fear and discomfort and afraid of those the people coming around you is it truly a way to like enjoy life no there there is no enjoyment there that's just survival and a lot of our history as a community has just been that of survival, not truly living. We're finally in the last, I would say, three to four decades, probably, like I'd say my lifetime, essentially really getting to a place where African-Americans are saying like, hey, look, we, we want to be able to live, not just to survive. Mm-hmm. And that's causing a lot of cognitive dissidence to those in the white community that are used to enjoying some uh, unjust favor and 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 and, un, and unearned privileges based upon the degradation of African American people. Uh, so that's that's going to continue to be a challenge because it's and, and it goes beyond just that you know the stereotypical you know rabid racist person you know Bubba redneck with the beer belly the stained wife beater waving the Confederate flag. I mean mm-hmm. we're talking about. People that are, you know, look nice and professional and suitable to have like, you know, really fancy titles and everything as far as their jobs. But they still harbor a lot of these same mindsets and, and, and opinions of black people. And they just exercise it through the, the imposition, through the development and imposition of policy versus physically taking out a gun or some type of weapon to, to, to hurt someone. So with the numbers being less than 30 percent that we discussed early on mm-hmm. and then in between that, we talked about the fear of gun ownership and why they looked at as a negative a connotation of a t- potentially cause a harm upon yourself. Mm-hmm. What do you think would be the reason behind us now becoming more involved and in, in, in picking up weapons and learning how to train and being a part of NAGA? 
So I, I think there's a couple of reasons. Um, you have a you have two two parallel things that are happening. One is once again some of the political upheaval that we've seen in excuse me the last five to ten years, mm-hmm. um, particularly you know certain members of uh, certain parties uh, with certain mindsets making statements that are reminiscent to statements that we saw out of some of the old Dixiecrats uh, in the South. And so that's really ringing alarm bells in a lot of minds of African-Americans say like, hey, you know, this is not OK. We've seen what this looks like. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we, we this is a problem. We need to do something about it. The second piece of it is um, even though there's still a lot of work that needs to be done mm-hmm. so that African-Americans truly are. Uh, treated and able to move and exercise their rights the same as anyone else in this country uh, without the baggage that has the baggage of of racism, white supremacy that that still impacts us so much. Mm -hmm. There has been movement and there has been an expansion of those rights to a space where there is a certain level that is that is respected at this point where you can't take for granted that you can just do this bad thing to a black person and there's no uh, consequences or repercussions, uh, yeah. or repercussions through actual law being used and implemented the way it should have always been used and implemented. Mm-hmm. So because those two things are happening in parallel, you have the impetus to own more farms and use them, plus the space to actually go and do that. So to to buy them, to to train with them, to own them. Uh, and then having uh, all these new tools such as social media and the Internet to communicate with other black people across the country. So even if you're in a locality where, you know, there's very restrictive gun laws and your community is just like, oh, no, we don't want anything to do with guns. You can still connect with other black people in mm-hmm. other localities that like, hey, it is accepted. It is seen as something that is not a taboo, but something that is a benefit to the individual and to the community. And learn from them and fellowship with them. So now you've got those support uh, measures that in the past just weren't present because you didn't have those new forms of communication that we, uh, in some cases, take for granted today. Right. So I guess. So we're talking about weapons and again, being at 30 percent under. So. In your opinion, like how has gun ownership affected amongst black women changed over the years? Because we've seen it since 2021, according to the NSSF, that we've seen an 87 percent increase of gun ownerships amongst black women. Like what, what would you think be the increasing spike with that? Once again, I think it goes back to um, part of it goes back to those two things that I just mentioned about the political upheaval and then having the space to actually do so. Mm-hmm. Um, specifically for black women, look, I'm not a black woman, so this is just my. I'm opinion. not either. <laughs> I know I got long hair, but no, I'm not. I'm not a black woman. <laughs> so, so please don't take this as the gospel. But from from my standpoint, looking at it. Mm-hmm. It appears to me that if we look at some trends, that well, have, but you have a unique standpoint because you're the national vice president. Sure. So you, I mean, even as being a part of of NAGA, mm-hmm. how have you seen like the increase, and what do you think the increase would have been with with Black women even joining the organization itself too? Well, it's funny you mentioned that. So our organization started in 2015. Mm-hmm. Uh, until about 2017, 2018, mm-hmm. our demographics for membership were 60 40 women to men in the organization. So that's members of the organization, right? Mm-hmm. So for effectively half of our existence. Uh, over half of our membership was black women. women. Okay. So, which was surprising because once again, uh, I think the stereotype of the gun owner, whatever other modifiers that you put on it, male is probably the primary one. Right. Uh, And we just did not see, that just was not the case for our organization. And so, uh, you know, I've had conversations with black women, Mm -hmm. uh, some that are close to me, some that are, you know, acquaintances, some they're just, you know, members that, you know, maybe they send in a message or they made a comment on a Facebook page or whatnot uh, that represents our work. And so one of the things that is a common thing brought up is a sense of safety and security. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we know that because of really bad policy that has been passed in this country in regards to criminal justice, we have seen a incredible draining of black men and boys from our community into the criminal justice system. Mm-hmm. Typically, in most communities in America, and this is not, you know, a worldwide thing, but you, you go to a place like the United States, 
normally it is the men that are the expected to be the the protectors, the defenders uh, of the house, and the, and the defenders of the house and of the community. When you have one in three black men that are going to serve some type of jail time, uh, that's not just them being taken out of the home and being in that cell. But once they get back and they've got that record, mm-hmm. you have that felony record. You can't own firearms. So now you have this group of men that uh, either they're not present or they're present and they cannot legally own the best tool available for personal self-defense. Mm-hmm. And then that also has impacts on uh, things like uh, uh, marriage rates and and child rearing in, in homes. So it, the, that that same criminal justice breaks up a lot of homes. You know, there there's a lot of incentives and in policy that would uh, incentivize um, those homes to stay broken mm-hmm. uh, that have been extended. Uh, so all that comes into a situation where you have a large number of black women that are just living single by themselves, and they may they, some of them have children, some of them mothers, some of them. Mm-hmm. Or just you know single living by themselves, and so they want to be able to protect themselves. Like that's just a natural human thing. That's not yeah. a black woman thing. That's not a black man thing. Just people want to have a sense of safety and security. And so if you don't have that available to you through traditional means, quote unquote traditional means of having that man or that male figure in your life that can provide that, mm-hmm. then what else is there available out there? And so I think really it's you have black women that are look, tab, looking at the landscape, taking a look at that and saying like, you know what, maybe I need to look at firearms ownership as that sort of uh, uh, stopgap measure. Yeah. And I mean, it's kind of a representation too of history because I mean, you're talking about coming from a multi-parent household mm-hmm. and the husband is out doing sharecropping or whatever throughout mm-hmm. the day, then the mother's left at home with the kids. So mm-hmm. generally they're the ones left to defend the house. Correct. Especially coming from the South. Like, I come from the rural parts of, well, the country part of Georgia. I come from Macon, Georgia. Okay. And so that was Got like the representation. Huh? Got some family down there. Yo, shout out to Macon, Mactown. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, I mean, because that's how we look at it. It's why, in my opinion, what I've seen mm-hmm. throughout history is that even though I have some family members that have been hesitant upon guns, if we look at history, they had to defend the house because they were the only ones there. Right. So the husbands were generally out doing all the work and they were ones that bring, they, they were the providers. Correct. But the mother had to be like, I mean, in nature, they have to protect the home and protect the kids. And even looking back in my own family, um, I've had stories where my mother's told me where her grandmother uh, and grandfather, Mm -hmm. they taught the, uh, you know, her parents Mm -hmm. and, you know, their her uncles and aunts about firearms ownership and being able to use it, particularly the aunts, because that same thing, you know, hey. They have expectation that the man's going to protect, but the man's not going to be there all the time. Right. If he's away working, and then once again, we're in. We're talking about the rural South. We're talking, you know, uh, that Reconstruction era. Mm-hmm. You know, there was a lot of, you know, former slave masters, just you know, angry, uh, 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 bitter white men that want to come by and yeah. they want to cause havoc and be that, you know, taking the woman and raping her or going out and trying to lynch the man later that night. You know, it manifested itself in a, in a number of different ways, but that meant that everybody had to be able to protect themselves. Mm-hmm. And so once again, getting into that, that individual protection, standing out into like that greater community protection, because the protection had to start in the home first before you can go out and say like, okay, we want to protect that bigger community. So we talked about the two different, especially with your, your family, the dynamics of like where people are growing up at, like the, their economic status, some mm-hmm. growing up in rural areas, some people growing up in the inner city areas. Mm-hmm. What role do you think social economics have when it comes to us and, and gun ownerships? Oh, it, that that always that has been and will be an issue for the foreseeable future. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, firearms, firearms training, firearms ownership is it's not an inexpensive uh, endeavor. Uh, it never has been. And so you really have to give credit to those African-Americans that were making even less money, you know, even adjusting for inflation, mm-hmm. had even less money, had even less resources that were able to make it happen. Say, so like, okay, I'm going to have some kind of firearm. Uh, and once again, so that impetus was was different. I mean, thankfully today, most of us can say we don't have to worry about a lynch mob coming by our house trying to drag us outside and and, and kill us. Depending on what right. part of town you live in. Like I said most of us now. I said most <laughs> yeah. of us. So once again, that's a, it's a very different impetus in yeah. 1892 than it was in you know 2022, right? right? So uh, I, I I think I, I cannot say that that has not been an impact. But but to the socioeconomic piece um, today, once again, there's a lot that life is much more complicated as far as all the things we have to worry about on the financial side today than in the past. 
And so once again, you're always trying to balance those things out. One thing we try to do with, with Naga is try to like level that playing field a little bit. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the training that we offer is just free of charge. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't cost the member anything but their time and, you know, whatever they spend on their ammo and gas to 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 get to the range. Repeat that again. So people so people <laughs> will know why they should join Naga. So you know, the biggest benefits you're going to get, you're going to get two huge benefits from your local Naga chapter. Mm-hmm. One uh, that you can't put a price tag on is just the level of fellowship that you want to get with other black people that are gun owners that you can learn from in a place of comfort, in a place of acceptance. The thing that you can put a price tag on, though, is how much money you save by not having to pay for all of the training that you would get through Naga. Um, And where the cost really only coming down to a lot of times is just the ammo that you have to pay for for the class and the gas that it takes, you know, you got to pay for to drive your car over to the the training location. Uh, Because, shoot, our members, I mean, if you go to an event and you come up there and say, like, oh, I don't have a gun. I mean, everybody's probably got like a spare, you know, one or two somewhere. Look, spare gun, spare uh, uh, eye protection, yeah. spare ear protection, ear protection ammo. You know, probably to keep you some snacks and some water yeah. whatever to help you through it. I mean, we we come pretty well prepared because we want anybody that comes into this space to 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 get what they need from that space. As long as they're coming uh, in good faith, mm-hmm. they're coming with a open mind to learn uh, and and with the inquisitiveness to ask the questions uh, because there are no dumb questions. Like we've we've heard all the questions, none of them are dumb because you just don't know what you don't know. Right. So come here with you know zero knowledge and an open mind to saying like, hey, look, I know nothing about guns, but I want to learn. I want to own one, and and we'll make sure you get taken care of. Now that being said, as proper gun owners. Do we have a responsibility to bridge the gaps between those who cannot participate in gun ownerships and those who can? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we, we do have that responsibility. Uh, a lot of the uh, members that I can, I can speak for Bass Reef chapter, but just multiple chapters across the country mm-hmm. where people came in, they, had, they didn't own a firearm. They may not have owned a firearm for months after they joined. Right. Because they were just learning and getting the information and, uh, you know, it may have been an issue of uh, finances. A lot of them it ran to was an issue of finances. So and they were trying to decide, you know, wait, well, how critical is this? I mean, I've heard about this gun ownership thing. You know, I can see some reasons why, but I really don't have a good perspective on it because I just don't have that information. Like, I just don't know. So where can I go? They come to Naga. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, spent months and months. You know, coming to meetings, coming to trainings, observing, you know, borrowing somebody's gun to use it to shoot. And, you know, six, eight, 12 months later down the road, they they post that picture in the group and say, like, hey, you know, I can't tell you how much, guys, I appreciate your training, your 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 work, your assistance and everything. I finally was able to, you know, set aside the money I needed. Mm-hmm. I had the education I needed to make a good decision on the kind of gun that I need to have. And I made my first gun purchase. And like they are so proud and we are so proud of them. Uh, we are so humble to be in a position that we can help to change people's lives in that way, because the the emotion that comes through when, you know, they 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 talk to you and they tell you, you know, how much impact you had. I mean, it, it is truly humbling. I mean, I, I can't count the number of conversations where, you know, people have told me, like, I've changed their life. And I'm like, OK, like. You probably I, mean, have. I, I, I didn't even know what to say to that because <laughs> I mean I was I was just doing what I felt should be done mm-hmm. from a person in my position uh, and a person like if I claim to have the 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 conviction and the belief in sharing this knowledge the way I have like these I, I these are the actions that need to come out of that and so I just pursued those actions mm-hmm. and so to have people that literally say that to you I mean there's no other feeling like it I don't I don't know how to describe it. Um, it just leaves me speechless every time. And I just, you know, tell them, Hey, you know, you're welcome, but you know, you did the work, right? All I did was provide the Avenue and the information, but you did the work of actually taking the steps that you needed. And so you need to reserve some of that, that appreciation for yourself because that couldn't have happened without you. I still, and as we wind down too, though, First of all, I want to thank you for coming on and thank you for sharing Absolutely. your experience and your expertise. Absolutely. But I do want to give like you your flowers and some of the other active members and other former presidents and presidents of this, this of Nagi itself, because 
you all deserve the rights and the credits and again your flowers because you're sharing of your time and giving of your time without asking for anything in return outside of making sure that people within our community are aware of their rights mm -hmm. and make sure they have proper gun usage training mm -hmm. so they can defend themselves and they can defend their families so thank you for what you do and thank you for being part of this organization and sharing your experience thank you i appreciate it I really now as, again as we want like is you have a final thought that you want to leave with the community I guess my final thought would be this uh, to all those out there. If you are not a gun owner, if you had any inkling of thinking, hey, maybe I want to try gun ownership. Maybe I just want to investigate what does it mean to actually use a firearm? And you don't feel that you've ever had a place where you could do that. Naga is that place. Uh, we've got over 100 chapters across the country uh, in over 35 states of the union. There's a place for you. Uh, we've got Facebook groups. We've got Instagram pages. Uh, you know, we're having training events that are going on across the country every weekend and even some days during the week as well, because, you know, we have all kind of different work schedules and life schedules, you know, that can support and help you to answer that question. Uh, we're not here. We don't we don't sell firearms. You know, we don't we aren't here to sell you on training or insurance or everything. We just want to make sure that you have the proper knowledge, history and context of farms ownership within the African-American community so that once you have all this information, you can make the decision for yourself and your family, whether this is something for you or it isn't. And if it's not, we're perfectly OK with that, because at the very least, you made that decision based on proper nuanced, contextualized information. All right. Well, I want to thank you again, and I want to thank you all for tuning in this week's episode. Make sure you go back and listen to our previous episode where we did talk about, we had uh, Kia Glenn in, that was here talking about black women and black gun ownerships and why it was important for her for her to get involved. And she's also a gun instructor as well. So make sure you turn on your notifications bell. You hit that subscribe button so you know about all the events that's taking place within the Bass Reeves community. And then follow us on all of our social media platforms so you can get involved and you can become a part of this gun culture where we try to train you and teach you the right things and how to handle yourself within gun ownership. So thank you all for tuning again. Thank you again, Doug. Absolutely. And until next time. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of the Bass Breeze Gun Club podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and family. Don't forget to like and comment on the show to let us know what you think. And if you're interested in learning more about firearm safety, proficiency, and the shooting sports, and you're in the Atlanta area, please consider joining the Bass Breeze Gun Club. We're a pro Second Amendment community of responsibly armed citizens, and we take pride in learning and sharing our knowledge within the community. You can find more about us and how to join at BassReevesGC.com. That's BassReevesG G as in Gary, C as in Cat.com. Remember, stay fearless knowing no master but duty. I am Antonio Hicks, and it's been my privilege to produce and edit this podcast, bringing these important conversations to life. But the conversation doesn't have to end here. If you're curious about more stories and insights in the avenue of politics, technology, and gaming, I invite you to join me on my own podcast, PTG TV. On PTG TV, we dive deep into a variety of topics exploring the intricacies of our world with a mix of humor, seriousness, and everything in between. It's a space where we challenge norms, celebrate diversity, and foster a community of curious minds and open hearts. You can find PGD TV on all major podcast platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. Just search for PTG TV and hit subscribe. All opinions expressed by the podcast host, participants, and creators are their own and do not reflect the opinions of Naga, the Bass Reeves Gun Club, which is the Atlanta chapter of Naga or affiliated gun ranges, gun clubs, or companies.